too. All right. I'm sounding very Mount Sinai. Let's make it more Mount of Olives. Okay. I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is you're going to be out of here by 9. <laughs> bad news is you are not going to be out of here by 8.30 unless you choose to leave by 8.30. That would be totally up to you and I would understand. Some of you have a bedtime. I understand that. Um, I went back and I looked at my slides and I said, man, is there anything I can cut out here? And the answer is no. Um, but I'm going to go through it really fast through the first four points and then I'm going to slow down on the fifth point because it's the most important one. Well, that's going to make you not listen to the first four. But it's, it's my favorite point, and I, I can't wait to share it with you. I'm literally jumping out of my skin. By the way, Jamie might mention this. Oh, I was going to do the little drawing, but I'll do that later. Do that later. We don't have time. You guys don't know the answers anyway. Um, um, oh, so tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Tomorrow, there is no meeting tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening's meeting is tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock right here in this facility. So I don't know if you're a member of this local church. If you are, you're welcome to come to your own home church. Isn't that nice, the visitor inviting you to come to your own home church? And if you're not, then you can play hooky on your home church uh, and come here. And if you don't normally go to church on Saturday and you typically go to church on Sunday, well then, hey, you, you're free. <laughs> you're free. So, so we'll be here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and I'm going to talk about five good reasons to doubt Darwin. And then 11 o'clock, I'm going to tell you five good answers to the question of suffering. And so we're going to go now to five good reasons to believe that God is good. We spent our first um, time, first session, just over an hour, on how uh, reasons to believe that God is good, or God exists, rather. Five good reasons to believe God exists. And now we transition from his mere existence to his character. Well, okay, so he exists. Who is he? What is he? Is he good? And if so, how do we know that? And I'm going to give you five good reasons to believe that God is good. All right, so let's uh, have a quick prayer and we'll dive in. Father in heaven, great to be here with these beautiful people, Lord. I just, I feel a real energy in this room, a happiness in this room. And um, thank you for this little snack that we got here on the break. And be with us now, Father. May our brains be energized for a good 40 minutes of really power-packed, biblically-based, spirit-filled instruction and I'm looking to you and, le and leaning on you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, here we go. Five good reasons to believe, is that plugged in? To believe that God is good. All right, reason number one. By the way, do you love that picture? Can you see that picture? The projector, the, or the, the screens don't really do it justice, but let me tell you about that picture very briefly. I took that picture in the most beautiful place I have ever been. Does anybody know where that is? I'd be amazed if somebody knew. It is not New Zealand, but that is the second most beautiful place in the world. It was the most beautiful place in the world, in my opinion, right up until I went to this place. Um, let me see if I can give... No, nobody's going to know where this is. Okay. This is a place... Called, let me tell you a story about this place. The youngest man, the youngest person that ever has been to every country in the world, he just recently completed his journey. He did it by the time he was 28 or something like that, or 32. He's very young. And he'd been to every country in the world. And I read an interview with him, and they asked him, what was the most, what was your favorite place or the most beautiful place you went to? And he said, Lord Howe Island. And that's what you're looking at right there. Lord Howe Island is an island about an hour and a half flight off the coast, the east coast of Australia. And it is astonishingly beautiful. By all means possible, get there before you die, if possible. If not, I think heaven's going to be better, but maybe not by much because it's pretty awesome. Okay. So anyway, reason number one to believe that God is good is he created the universe and he created our world and he made them really good. Scripture says these words again and again and again in Genesis chapter 1, and God saw that it was good, 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 and then it closes Genesis 1, 31 with these words, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, 
If I say that something's good because I am a fallen human being who has a compromised standard of goodness, it may not be good by your standard. Um, I might hear a song and say that's a really good standard, but you might be a professional musician and think that my song is not a good song. Or I might see a painting and think, hey, that's a really good painting, but you might be a, a very talented painter and look at the painting that I think is a good painting and say that's not a good painting. So my standard of goodness is compromised and qualified by the person that I am. God's standard of goodness, though, is infinite, and it is infinitely perfect. So if God says something is very good, that means it is astonishingly good by our standards. And so in the beginning when God created, he made the universe and the world very good. So let me just talk to you a little bit about so much of the good that is in the world today. First of all, companionship and friendship. Right? These are two things that, that we easily take for granted because we were born into a social reality. We take a social reality for granted. But the truth of the matter is, is that when you, st you st step back and just think about the nature and the beauty of having a best friend or close friends or a circle of friends or for those of us that are fortunate enough to have a spousal companion that we regard as our second self, some people say, oh, my wife is my best friend. I, I feel like, the, or my husband is my best friend. I feel like the language best friend falls so short of the nature of the relationship that I have with my spouse. She is not my best friend. She is so much more than a best friend. She's my second self. She knows where my wallet is when I don't know where my wallet is. She knows what I'm trying to say when I don't know what I'm trying to say. You know, she, she is the mirror image of me. She is strong in all the places that I am weak, and she's weak in some of the places that I am strong. Together, we, we fit together in a synergistic synchronistic way that is indescribable. Truly, in Genesis 1 and 2, God said everything was good, 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 but he said there was one thing that was not good, and he said it is not good that man should be alone. And if you are fortunate enough or blessed enough to be in one of those marriages where you're not just surviving, you're not just in an economic relationship with somebody that you share a bed with and occasionally, you know, you negotiate terms, but you really have a connection with that partner, this is a beautiful gift. It can be, that's all it can be described at as is a gift, a gift from God himself. If you don't have that, hey, listen, certainly you have friends, companions, associates. It's a beautiful thing, and we're surrounded by it, and we take it for granted. We don't all take it for granted, but it's easy to take it for granted. That's probably the better thing to say. The second one here is love and sex. What a, what a fascinating reality that exists. There is no, probably no, um, higher physical uh, sensation that the human being can experience. And in a wonderful act of, of grace, God made the life-giving act also the most pleasurable act that a human being can engage in, which is really remarkable when you think about it, because God could have made the act by which children are brought into the world like a handshake, Right? I mean, I mean that, that's an option available to him. So it, it could have been like, hey, would you like to have a child? Well, you know, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay, all right. You know, let's, let's wait and see if you get pregnant. No. God, God did this really cool, really amazing thing. And it's something that, that we, because we are not only social beings, we're social sexual beings, it's something that's very easy to take for granted. That, that the life-giving act is the, arguably the single most pleasurable act that a human being can participate in. And that's with great intentionality. It's purposeful that God said, hey, listen, I am the creator. I am the giver of life. And I am the creator of pleasure. And I'm going to blend creation and pleasure together in this remarkable, amazing thing that we know as human sexuality which then results in something else that's absolutely amazing, babies. Am I wrong or am I right? Is there anything that is small and young and cute? Is there anything that's like in its baby form that's not cute? Right? I mean, almost everything, little baby owls look amazing. Little baby seals look amazing. You know, how many of us have been lured into bringing a kitten home? Right? And we just forget that the problem with kittens is that they turn into cats, right? And... <laughs> And, I mean, babies, babies are cute, and little kittens are cute, and little puppies are cute, right? It was just, there's so much goodness in the world, and not just babies, but children. I tell you, one of the joys in my life are my two boys. And I think part of the reason for that is I've given a lot of thought to why children bring such joy to their parents. And, you know, not always joy, but let's be honest. Um, I think the number one reason is this, at least this is what it is for me. I feel like 
with my sons, my two boys, and I wished I would have had a little girl. In fact, I'll tell you a cute little story. I'm begging my wife. She just turned 40, and I told her, baby, 40's the new 30. Let's do this. <laughs> and, and I'm just begging her to have a child, a little girl. And, uh, and she's just not having any of it. But I'm, just, hey, I'm still working the angles. I'm like, hey, listen, let's do this. Working. She's not feeling. But anyway, here's the point. So she and I text back and forth while I'm here in America. She's in Australia. And my son got onto my computer, which also has texts. And he texted me last night, sweetheart, let's make a baby. A little girl. And I was like, I texted her last night. I was like, yes, let's do it. This will be great. Then I woke up this morning, was going throughout my day. My wife wakes up. She reads her text. She's like, hey, that last text? I'm like, yes. She's like, Landon sent that. <laughs> That's my son. That's my son. So anyway, anyway, so here's my point. Here's my point. That wasn't even my point. Just a cute little story. The point is, is that the great thing about children is you get to live your life over again. You get to catch a ball for the first time. You get to take a step for the first time. You get to see a hippopotamus for the first time. You get to see a giraffe for the first time. You get to go swimming for the first time. You, you get to go ice skating again for the first time. You get to live your life vicariously through your children. And I'm told, though I don't yet know this experientially, that it's, it's almost better with your grandchildren because you get to send them home. You get to have all of those great experiences and then send them home, Right? Okay, here's another one. Mangoes, blueberries, and peaches. I mean, are you kidding me? Really? I mean, food. Just think of the taste of a mango or of blueberries. I mean, life is good. The simple pleasures, right? Even if your whole world is falling apart, go down to the store, buy some fresh blueberries, and eat them. Your life will get better, <laughs> right? If only momentarily, it will be better. Or if you can get your hands on a good mango, which is next to impossible in the United States of America. But if you come to Australia, you can get them. They grow in our yard, by the way. We have five mango trees. I know, it's terrible. And we're just coming into mango season right when I get back. I know, you feel sorry for me. But anyway, <laughs> you can come visit. But if you ever can just get your hand on a mango, even if you're in the deepest of depressions, just, just take a few bites. And at least for that moment, you'll be like, life is good. God is good, life is good, the little pleasures. And finally here, music. How many people out there would rate music as very important to your life? Very important. Yeah, me too. And, and there are just certain emotions that you feel, especially for those of you that are music lovers, that you cannot feel under any other stimulus. It not, I mean, reading can produce a certain kind of feeling, and poetry produces another, and uh, blueberries produce another, and lovemaking produces another, and children produce another, but there is something that music does that nothing else can do. And I've, I've been fascinated by music for years, and uh, read a book a number of years ago called This Is Your Brain on Music. Fascinating book, by the way. And there is just, we are wired to appreciate music, melody, and rhythm, and harmony. And so we are surrounded by so much goodness. But the list doesn't stop there. How about this one? Indian food. Yeah? Who else out there is feeling the goodness of God in Indian food? All of the textures and the flavors and the curries. Yes! And how about Thai food? Anybody else out there? By the way, this is my order. This is the order of preference. So Indian, Thai food, yes? Are you kidding me? Masaman curry, Tom Kha soup. I mean, stop it. Mediterranean food, any tabbouleh lovers out there? Majadra, falafel, come on. Are you kidding? Italian food? Good Italian food? I'm not talking about just spaghetti with sauce. I'm talking about good Italian food. Do you love it? And McDonald's. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I put that up there. Okay, so there's just so much good in the world. Now, C.S. Lewis says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for these desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. Watch this. It's a very persuasive line of reasoning. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men, and presumably women, feel sexual desire. And there is such a thing as sex. Now, watch this. If, however, I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Now, follow his line of reasoning because it's brilliant. For every desire you have, there is the resolution of that desire. 
right? You're hungry, there is food. You want water, you're thirsty, there is uh, liquid to, to, to slake your thirst. You, you want to, you, 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 duckling wants to swim, there you go. Men, want to, men and women want to have sexual interaction. They're all, for every desire that we have, there is the potential resolution of that desire. But Lewis says, but wait a minute, what if I have in some difficult to describe part of me this yearning, this hungering, this desire that no experience on this earth can satisfy, he says the best explanation is that I was made for another world, a better world, a world that God himself would call very good. Now, the world that we live in here is a very good world, but it's a world that's been largely compromised. And we're going to talk about the nature of that compromise tomorrow in our second session. So you were created for pleasure, you were created for joy, and you were created for holiness. And you probably believed that, but what I, what, I, what I want you to notice is the second part of what I've written here. You were created for pleasure, for joy, and for holiness, and these are not different things. God takes pleasure in your God-honoring pleasures, and God takes great joy in your God-honoring joys. When you are at your happiest, God is thrilled. When you are at your most joyful, this brings God, the glory of God, in the words of the Westminster uh, Confession, the glory, the, the, what is the chief end of man? The, the, the chief end of man is to know God and to enjoy him forever. One of the early Christian fathers, his name escapes me right now, said, the glory of God is man fully alive. The glory of God is seen when mankind is fully alive and enjoying all of the pleasure and joy and happiness and connectivity that comes from this beautiful, amazing thing that we call life when it's at its best. Now, I know that everybody in this room knows sorrow as well. You know tragedy as well. You know depression as well. You know disappointment as well. You know failure as well, as do I. But is it not the case that the sorrow that we feel today is simply the absence of the happiness that we felt in the past? Isn't it true that in some significant sense, the only reason that we know sorrow is that we've known happiness? The uh, Lebanese prophet Khalil Gibran famously said that the well of our, or the waters of our happiness are only as deep as the well of our sorrows. We can know it beautiful because we've known it sad and, and, and bad. Now, who better to fulfill your desires and my desires than him who made the heart to desire itself? God made your heart with all of the desires, with all of the passions, with all of the longings that you have. And who better to fulfill the longing desires of your heart than him that made your heart to desire in the first place? There's this great text of scripture found in one of the minor prophets where God's Messiah, Jesus, is referred to as the desire of all nations. The Messiah is the desire, the longing, the craving of all nations, of every human heart. The answer is yes. Look at Psalm 16, verse 11. You will show me the path of life, says the psalmist. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is not a killjoy. God is not down on human pleasure. In fact, God is way up on human pleasure. God created you to experience pleasure. In fact, the Garden of Eden, Genesis 1 and 2, the word Eden means pleasure. It's what the word means. God took Adam and, his Eve, Adam and Eve, his son and his daughter, and he placed them in the garden of pleasure. And he said, of every tree you may freely eat. God gave them opportunity to engage in all of the various trees that were there. As we've already mentioned, he made the social sexual interaction, the, the, the lovemaking, life-giving uh, connection between a man and a woman, a highly wonderful and pleasurable experience. God created those things. He made those things because he takes great pleasure in our pleasure when they are God-honoring pleasures. They bring him happiness and joy. You were made for pleasure, and God takes pleasure in all of your God-honoring pleasures. So that's reason number one. Life is awesome when it's at its best. Okay, here's reason number two. Reason number two to believe that God is good is that universally we crave meaning, goodness, and joy. This is not a David Asherick thing. This is not a Colorado thing. This isn't an American thing. This is a universal human experience. We crave meaning. We, we want our lives to matter, and every one of us in this room to some degree believes that your life matters. That, that you, you, we have a sense almost that there's a movie that's taking place behind our eyes. And there's, and you know, and there's a movie, and we see ourselves in, in some sense as playing a part, uh, large or small, in this grand reality that's taking place in the world. We, we intuit that our life has meaning. Uh, every Hollywood movie, or not every, the vast majority of Hollywood movies 
communicate to us what we know intuitively, that, that your life has some kind of meaning, that there's, that there's purpose, right? I'm talking about the best of Hollywood movies, not the, not the junk. And we crave goodness and we crave joy. Most of us in this room would self-identify as good people or we would identify as people that want to be good people. It's a natural human desire to want to be the best versions of ourselves and we long for joy. Now, I'm gonna share with you a quotation that's a little challenging, it's one of my all-time favorite quotations. It's only the second time I've ever shared it in a sermon because it's a little heady, but I figured what a great opportunity to share it. So if you get it, great. If you don't, just wake up in about 120 seconds. This is from Simon, uh, Simone Weil. She's a French Christian philosopher uh, who lived in the early 1900s, and she writes, In the period of preparation, the soul loves in emptiness. It does not know whether, whether anything real answers its love. She's describing the experience of the person who is not yet connected with God. And in that period of preparation before we come to God, the, the, the soul loves, it longs to love and be loved, but it does so in emptiness without any fundamental or foundational connection. And she says, the soul does not know whether anything real answers back in that love. Right? She continues, it, it may believe that it knows, but to believe is, is not to know. Such, the, such a belief does, does not really help. The soul knows for certain only that it is hungry. Now we're going to see this is the very analogy that Jesus himself used. The soul knows that it is hungry. The important thing is that the soul announces this hunger, this longing, this craving by crying. And every one of us in this room knows that feeling. That feeling of longing, why am I here? Why did I treat the person that way? We, we crave meaning and we crave an answer. We, we want God and we want to know that he's there. The important thing is that it announces its hunger by crying. A child does not stop crying if we tell it that there is no bread. The child's crying, child's hungry, and we say, well, there's no bread. Oh, there's no bread, I'll stop crying. No, the child continues to cry because the hunger is real. It goes on crying just the same. The danger is not lest the soul should doubt whether there is any bread, but lest by a lie the soul should persuade itself that it is not, in fact, hungry. It can only persuade itself of this by lying, for the reality of its hunger is not a belief, it's a certainty. You see what she's on to here? She's on to this reality that we know at our most fundamental level, we long for something bigger than ourselves. We long for beauty. We long for joy. We long for meaning. We long for purpose, and we know it. And when our lives fall short of that ideal that we want to attain to, we feel a sense of, of crying. Now, not everybody does this because nowadays we're so distracted with Facebook and social media and television and computers that we don't even, we've lost the art of reflection and self-reflection. And, but in those quieter moments, back before the advent of televisions and smartphones that are making dumb people, we, there were opportunities to sit and reflect on the nature of life and to not be uninterruptedly distracted by a thousand pictures and a thousand posts and a thousand things that are calling for our attention. Okay? And what Wheel says here is so true. In those quieter moments when we are falling short of the grand ideal of a true soul connection with God, we know that we hunger and thirst. How did Jesus say it? Hunger and thirst for rightness, for holiness, for goodness. The God that our heart craves is the very God that Scripture reveals. Well, isn't that a happy coincidence? The very God that our heart longs to be real, that we hope is real. In the words of my good friend Ty Gibson, the longing desire of every human heart is to be fully known and yet fully loved. And this is what we wrestle with. Because most of us operate under the assumption, whether or not we would ever say so or not, that if we were fully known, we could not be fully loved. But what do we do with the God of Scripture who knows us exhaustively and loves us completely. To be fully known and fully loved, if that were true, would be the greatest of all possible joys and pleasures. I want to say that again. To be fully known and yet to be fully loved would be the greatest of all possible joys and pleasures. Yes? The very God that we want to exist, the very God that our heart cries out for, does exist. And not only does he exist, he's revealed in scripture as amazingly good. 
And of course, it just stands to reason because the God who created our heart created, as Augustine said, in our hearts, a God-shaped void, a, a void that cannot be filled with alcohol or entertainment or, or illegitimate relationships. It can only be filled with the one who made the whole himself, and he made that whole in his own shape. Mm. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those, Jesus said, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is the very point that Simone Weil was making. The soul hungers, but what is it hungering for? It's thirsting. Jesus purposefully doesn't say here, you know, this is academic, this is intellectual, this is cerebral. No, Jesus uses something that's more visceral than that. It's more uh, to hunger. I mean, how, how, how do you know when you're hungry? You just know it. Your, your body begins to say, hey, look, there's a, there's a vacancy here. There's a need here. We need something. And in the same way, there's a vacancy in us. And we say, hey, I need something. I'm hungering and I'm thirsting. What, what is better in life than when you're really thirsty and you get to drink cold water or some cold beverage or refreshment? Man, you're in Colorado. Man, the beer companies, make, they make millions of dollars off of selling that imagery. Now, I don't know how anybody can actually enjoy beer, but people apparently do. But, but the whole idea that when you're super thirsty, you just want to slake that thirst with something cold and refreshing. Are you with me on that? Just awesome. I can remember some of my best memories. I think I was severely dehydrated as a boy because I can remember some of my best memories were making it to the water fountain after recess as a boy and just like looking at the water fountain and be like, this is going to be so good. <laughs> Does anybody else have that experience? I think I was just hugely severely dehydrated. And when I'd get there, I couldn't swallow hard. I was like, ugh, 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 ugh. I mean, just, just like forcing it in, and I just stay at that fountain. And I remember kids used to say to me, hey, save some for the fish. You know, just like, ah. Oh. John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Does, your, does our heart hunger for something of sustenance? It does, of course. Our heart hungers. In the words of G.K. Chesterton, I love this. He says, the purpose of an open mind is very similar to the same, is very uh, similar to the purpose of an open mouth, to close around something solid. Right? We, we, we hunger and long for something substantive, something solid. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. When Jesus finds his place in that God-shaped hole, that, that vacuum in our heart, we become fully alive. We become the people that we were created and saved to be. And it's a beautiful, happy thing. And it's an evidence that God is good. Number three. Our reality, the reality that we exist in, is compellingly explained in the context of these three words, that God is love. Now, I'm going to explore this in depth in our second presentation tomorrow, but I'll give you a quick introduction. Here are things that we take for granted intuitively. If your brain is working correctly and you are alive and breathing, then you take these things for granted.